R.V. Oaks is an extremely important early decision of the Supreme Court of Canada having to do with the idea of being innocent until being presumed innocent until proven guilty, the idea of who has to prove that you are uh, innocent or guilty, and uh, how Section 1 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms ought to be interpreted. Section 1 is an interesting case because it seems to be a, a section of the Charter that allows us to limit uh, charter rights, but it doesn't say exactly how that should be done. And so um, the court, very early on in its history, as a court interpreting the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, had to figure out how to deal with this section. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, the purpose of this presentation is both to talk about this extremely important Supreme Court decision, uh, but to do so in the context of our philosophy of law class and some of the things that we've discussed in that class. It's also to give you an example of how you can prepare your own presentations for submission to the class. Now, I'm probably going to take a little bit longer than uh, you would be expected to take, partly because I'm going to present a couple of different theories. You only have to present one. And I'm going to raise them periodically and uh, suggest how they might apply or what kinds of debates we might have about them. You're encouraged to do that as well, to talk about how the theory can apply, what kinds of questions are raised by the decisions that you're dealing with. Of course, you're not going to be dealing with RV Oaks, you'll be dealing with other things, and that's great because we need to uh, see how these theories can apply in the real world. So we're gonna move on and uh, get into RV Oaks. Before we do that, I doubt that I used these sources. These are the main sources I used to prepare the uh, presentation. I uh, may have used a couple of others without really uh, remarking upon it. You need to also give your sources, and I recommend you do so as the second page in your presentation. Oh, and also remember to uh, include your name and uh, all the type of all the information that you saw on the first slide. And of course, you can just go back and look at it to see what's going on there. All right. So let's now get right into it. The case started in Ontario Superior Court. It was against David Edwin Oakes, who was found by the police in possession of hashish oil. He had 10 vials of it. Um, he had $150. He had a rather 600 some odd dollars in cash, and he had and he had paid $150 for the hashish oil. Now, none of these things are uh, in doubt. They're all just facts of the case. He told the police that hashish oil was for his personal use and he said that the cash that he had was from a government check and that matters because he was going to be charged with trafficking but now why was he charged with trafficking? The initial accusation was that he was in possession of controlled substances under section 4 of the Narcotic Control Act and he was found guilty of that. There was no question he was in possession of hashish oil and he wasn't supposed to be. The problem is this Section 8 of the Narcotic Control Act said that if found guilty of possession, a person would then be assumed to be a trafficker unless that person could prove their innocence. So in the case of Edwin Oakes, he had to prove his innocence, prove that he wasn't actually planning to sell the stuff instead of just use it for his own personal uh, recreational purposes. Did this violate his right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty? Well, that's the question. The, the problem, of course, is this. They were saying he was assumed to be a trafficker. Well, hold on. Possession is one, is one crime, but trafficking is a separate, more serious crime. And so if the fact that you are in possession of controlled substances is then taken by itself to be evidence that you are trafficking in controlled substances, then you might just have a problem regarding Section 11D of the Charter because you might not be being presumed innocent until proven guilty. And that, in fact, is what the lower court found, that that right of his had been violated. And so they found him guilty of possession, but not of trafficking. And that then, of course, appealed by the Crown, by the prosecution, to the Ontario Court of Appeal, which found the same thing, essentially. They found that the presumption of innocence under 
Section 11D was violated by this law. But then they added something interesting. They said that some reverse onus could be valid if the reverse onus, the reverse onus constituted a reasonable limit on the right in question, not a right, but this specific right, and that the onus was demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society, and that was citing section one. Now, that was interesting because it meant that even though the violence, the, the uh, violation of the presumption of innocence was, dis was found to be there, the court was saying, if you could satisfy these two things, then the violation could be justified, which is a big deal. However, in this case, they said it didn't meet the standard and they dismissed the Crown's appeal. And the Crown said, hold on. And so they went to the Supreme Court of Canada. The Supreme Court of Canada doesn't have to accept the appeal, but they did. And they did because this was a very, very important issue. And they, uh, and they were asked the constitutional question, does this law in fact impose a reverse onus? And is it therefore unconstitutional? And what's interesting is that this question here, is it unconstitutional, is going to be a matter where we're going to find some nuance. Because, of course, the court said, yes, it does impose a reverse onus. But then it said, we have more questions to ask about this. Why is that? Well, before we get there, let's talk a little theory. First of all, the term onus simply means a responsibility, a duty, something you have to do. In this case, the onus that we're talking about is the onus of having to prove that someone is guilty or innocent. And we call that, right, the burden of proof, right? The person who bears the burden of proof is the one who has to prove that prove the thing in question, in this case, the guilt of the accused person, as opposed to the accused person having to prove their own innocence. The presumption of innocence in other words, places the onus of proving that someone is guilty on the crown, on the prosecution, and not the other way around. Because if you flip it around and you, call, and you say that the person who's accused of the crime has to prove that they are innocent and that therefore they are not presumed innocent, that's what we call a reverse onus. And a reverse onus is the thing that we want to avoid through the use of 11D of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So a reverse onus is something to avoid. And the question now had to be, is this law a reverse onus? And if so, how do we know? And then if it's a reverse onus, can it be justified anyway? And we're going to go on with that in a moment. But first, I just want to talk for a second about, because we've been talking about legal positivism in class. And according to Hart's version of legal positivism, you'll recall there are primary and secondary rules. Laws are basically rules. And the primary rules are just the laws that we follow. So the Narcotic Control Act would be a primary rule. Section 8 of the Narcotic Control Act would be a primary rule. Uh, and then um, there would be secondary rules that would apply in any case um, to that law or to the people uh, enforcing the law, making the law, and so on. In this case, I'm interested in two things. One is just his rule of adjudication is the rule, among other things, that gives the Supreme Court its, um, according to him, it's the rule that would give the Supreme Court its authority, its power. All the other courts have to do what the Supreme Court says once it's decided. That's going to be covered by a rule of adjudication. I'm not really that interested in it, except just to note it. What I'm really interested in, in this case, is a rule of recognition. And the rule of recognition that we're going to talk about in this case is going to be that no law may be contrary to the principles and values of the Charter. And I want you to notice that I've said principles and values and not words, right? I haven't said the words of the Charter, although that would also be covered. Um, Hart is someone who will typically talk about 
the text of the law, the meaning of the law, the explicit law, but the way he talks about it allows us to talk about the meaning of the law as well. And so that's what we're going to look at in here. The principles and values and not necessarily only the words. Although I have to say that uh, the words are also going to be important for um, an applica positivist application of this uh, rule. All right, let's look on at uh, another way of looking at Ronald Dworkin's approach. We're going to be seeing that uh, in the in hard cases, and of course this is a standard, or at least it's a, it's a very evident hard case uh, that we're going to be talking about, um, hard cases require judges to do more than just interpret what we could call black letter law, which is this law that we can read, uh, the law that positivists talk about, the law that we can read or recite. Uh, instead, he says we should be talking about full law, which means including the uh, background to the law, the political context the law comes from, the uh, moral context, the cultural context, and so on, so on, of the law. And when judges deliberate over uh, how to solve difficult problems, uh, they have to deliberate using all of those kinds of considerations. Now, what's important for us to remember here is that Dworkin is going to say that rights are trumps. He's not going to be very sympathetic to limiting rights in any way. And yet, he does uh, respect the roles of constitutions, especially constitutions that come out of deep political uh, uh, sources such as the Canadian Constitution, which came out of a long debate about the meaning of our country and what our country was going to look like in the future. It came out of a long debate about our history as well and what that history meant and how we could then move it into the future and many, many other things. There was a long political debate and our Constitution, including our Charter of Rights, is the result of a compromise that was made at one point along the way and everything in it is intended to reflect that compromise and that vision for a country that would be able to move into the future. Now if I take it as being that kind of thing and perhaps slightly idealistic the way I just described it, then we do have to think about section one as being something that the framers of the Constitution really intended to be taken seriously and it is quite possible that Dworkin would also take that seriously and ask what kinds of limitations on rights, if he would accept any, would we consider reasonable, given the political, moral, and historical, and other context of the Charter and the way it's applied. So, compare Dworkin and Hart, we're talking about, in the case of Hart, even though really he's going to talk tell us the kind of rule we ought to apply, but not necessarily how to apply it. In the case of this rule of recognition, if I'm right, I think Hart's uh, approach would require us to think about principles and values in, that are implied in the Charter. In other words, don't just read the words, read what the words mean, and uh, let's put them in the context of all the other words that are there, and let's figure out what's going on. And I have a feeling that uh, this would be helpful to us in terms of understanding what's going on. And when we get to it, you can see whether you think that principles and values implied by the Charter are being, are being applied in this decision. Whereas on, in the case of Dworkin, Dworkin's going to say that uh, we're talking about interpreting and not creating new law. We're talking about interpreting the law that's there. And he's going to say there's no actual rule that we're going to apply. We're going to apply a holistic approach, taking care of everything sort of at once. We're going to figure out what the text means. Remember the concept of exegesis, right? Hermeneutics. We're going to be exegetes regarding the text of the law and pull out its meaning, for including the moral, political, cultural context that it comes from, using the key ideas that are implied by the text, law, rights, democracy, freedom, and justification. And in the end, it is entirely possible that the upshot of an application of one or the other approach might not turn out to be all that different, but that remains to be seen. And we're not going to conclude one way or the other by the end. These are just questions I'd like you to be thinking about. So what is this right we're talking about anyway? And what is this decision in the end? What is all this stuff we have to do? Well, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Section 11 
at D says that any person charged with an offense has the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty according to law in a fair and public hearing by a tribunal that is independent and impartial. What matters for us is this, to be presumed innocent and proven guilty according to law. That's what we're most interested in right now. And this is the onus, okay? The burden of proof is here is on the crown because you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. That means that the judge has to look at you and the jury has to look at you and say, until somebody proves me otherwise, this guy's guilty. This guy's rather innocent. This guy's not guilty until somebody proves to me that he is. Okay, and they have to do it in a way that's consistent with the law. And the law includes the Charter of Rights. So, is Section 8 of the Narcotics Act a law that violates this presumption of innocence? In other words, does it produce a reverse onus? If it is to be adequate and not a reverse onus, well, it's not a reverse onus if there's a link between the things you know and the things you think you know that is rational and beyond a reasonable doubt. If all those things are true, then it's not a reverse onus. Why? Because if you, if the things you know rationally lead you to certain automatic conclusions. So, for example, if it were true that uh, everyone always who purchases any drugs always resells them to someone else, if that turned out to be a true fact, then knowing that someone had just purchased some, some drugs would always mean that they were going to sell the drugs. So if the link between the things we know and the things we think we know were that solid, then it wouldn't be a reverse onus. It would just be a natural conclusion from the facts. But in fact, the uh, court points out, the court led by uh, Chief Justice Brian Dixon in its decision, points out that the link with the, between these characteristics cannot be shown. The link between the things that we know and the things that we think we know cannot be shown to be rational and beyond a reasonable doubt. Therefore, there is a reverse onus. Therefore, what we've done is we've essentially said, look, dude, you have to prove that you're innocent. We're not going to try to prove that you're guilty. That's a reverse onus, and therefore, the law violates section, 1, section 11D, and that's a problem for the Crown, because now we've been shown, they've been shown, the law's been shown to be in violation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but there might be a way out. Because, because my, for some reason my, <laughs> I was having a little trouble with my arrow button. But if you look at section one of the charter, this is the very first thing. This is an interpretive clause. In other words, this is a clause, or this is a section in the charter that you can use to interpret the rest of the charter. What does this mean? Well, it means this thing, but it also means this. It means the thing that it says at 11D, but 11D has to be interpreted in the light of Section 1. So, how do we read it? Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it, yay, subject only to such reasonable limits, ooh, prescribed by law, as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Notice subject only to such reasonable limits. The limits have to be prescribed by law and the limits have to be able to be demonstrably, they have to be able to be justified demonstrably so in a free and democratic society. And notice here we have a few values. You have the value of the rule of law. You have the value of freedom. You have the value of democracy. And whatever else is implied by these, you also have those. 
You also have the notion of reasonability. Right? So you have all of these things that are coming in that have to be taken into account when dealing with the charter. So erasing all of those and adding a question, does this particular reverse onus constitute a reasonable limit on Edward Oaks' rights? Mr. Oaks is condemned uh, or convicted of possession. Does he now have to prove that he's not a trafficker? Is that reasonable according to that? Well, let's look. The court looked at it. They had to think of it. This was the first time they'd done it. They came up with something extremely important. Test. Now, the Oaks test is used to this day, every time someone finds, every time the Supreme Court or any court finds that a, uh, a law violates a right in the charter, the next question they always must ask is, is that right, is that limitation of the right reasonable under Section 1? In order to show this, the reason must be demonstrable, and they say there are three basic things that you have to do. First of all, the law itself must be fair and non-arbitrary. This is something that we saw when we talked about Law and Fuller. This is something we saw talking about many different philosophers of law and, in fact, something that was identified at the beginning of the semester as a basic principle of, of law, that, that laws must be fair and laws must be non-arbitrary. Uh, the law must also be deliberately designed deliberately designed to achieve an important objective. And that important objective must be sufficiently important that it justifies the infringement on the right of the right. And that law must be rationally connected to the objective in a way that minimizes the infringement of the right. So you have two things. You have one, it has to be deliberately designed to achieve a, a very important objective. And then second, it has to be rationally connected to the objective in a way that minimizes the infringement. Okay, so, and of course here you have, it has to be rationally connected and it has to minimize. You have these different things going on here. And then the third thing is it must be proportional. You can only have a severe limitation on a right if you have a great danger or an extremely important objective that you're trying to meet. So this particular law meet those criteria. Well, Section 8 of the uh, Narcotic Act was found to be fair and non-arbitrary, and it was found to be following a very important goal given the social health and other problems created by narcotics trafficking. But the law was not rationally connected to its objective because there is no reasonable link between the possession of small quantities of narcotics and the assumption that they're meant for sale. And so this law did not pass the Oaks test. Now it's worth noting that the law was also, the court also explicitly assumed that the rights in the charter would always apply without limitation unless the burden of proof that was outlined in the Oaks test could be met by the state. So this has now become a standard test that always has to be considered when legislatures are passing laws and when, um, and when courts are adjudicating the laws. The outcome, of course, this law was unconstitutional. It violated Section 11D of the Charter. It violated... Mr. Oaks' presumption of innocence, as therefore Section uh, 8 of the Narcotic Control Act was found not to be a reasonable limit on that right, and um, it was struck down. The appeal was dismissed. Oaks had been convicted of possession, but he was not convicted of trafficking. It's worth asking what Dworkin would think about this, and it's worth asking what Hart would think about this, and it's worth asking what you think about this, because this is the law, and this is how the courts have now uh, now have to apply uh, applications of the charter 
when laws are found to violate uh, our charter rights. They then have to apply the Oaks test to make sure that those violations of our rights are not reasonable. And uh, so that's a very interesting and important thing to know about Canadian jurisprudence. Now uh, that's it. I hope that's been helpful. Uh, this was a little longer, as I said at the beginning, than you're expected to be. Um, but uh, there you go. I will see you guys in class.